The term socialism appears to be enjoying a resurgence of public interest, both favorably where it is self-prescribed and pejoratively where it is meant to degrade the respectability of public figures. From early 2016, at the height of Bernie Sanders' campaign for the Democratic Party nomination, um, to Alexandra Cortez's victory over Joe Crowley this June, uh, the term socialism appears to be gaining some level of purchase and a whole lot of press. In many instances, socialism is commingled with terms as varied as social democrat, communist, Marxist, anarchist, etc. Uh, as such, we view this as an opportune moment to ask, what is socialism? What do public figures mean when they identify themselves as socialists or any other, uh, any other of its varied strains? And what do their opponents think socialism means? Uh, what does socialism mean and what can it mean? And perhaps most important of all, what did it mean? So I'll let the panelists uh, introduce themselves and then we can get started. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. My name is A.M. Gitlitz. I'm a freelance writer, independent researcher, and a worker. And uh, my work focuses on uh, um, radical politics, counterculture. Uh, in the last year, I've been researching the Posadist movement, um, so writing about both the history of Latin American Trotskyism in kind of a boring way, and then also the intersection between ufology and uh, apocalyptic socialism and, and Marxism. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. I thank you also. I'm John Garvey. I'm, uh, among other things, currently I'm one of the co-editors of Insurgent Notes, an online journal of communist theory and practice. We started in 2010. Somewhat amazingly, we're up to either issue number 17 or 18. Uh, and uh, I also am an editor, uh, one of the editors of a journal called Heartcrackers, which is a very different kind of publication. It's subtitled Chronicles of Everyday Life, uh, the pub and we have a fairly active uh, blog on that as well. And the kind of the articles feature kind of accounts from from the title of kind of you know, ordinary people involved in a variety of different settings, work, jails, prisons, subways, you know, and mostly here in, in the States, mostly in, in New York, but not only that, we have an active Southern correspondent, some active South African correspondents, and we're kind of, uh, so that's, I encourage you to check that out. Uh, as you'll hear, I'm, I'm a creature of the politics of the late 1960s, uh, and for the better part of the 1970s, I was a member of a group called the Taxi Rank and File Coalition here in New York City, uh, we then went on to do other things. From the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, I was one of the co-editors of Race Trader, uh, which perhaps some of you have come across, a, a journal dedicated to the abolition of whiteness, and I remain committed to that political position, which I perhaps will also talk about. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Taylor, for the invitation, and to Platypus, I'm Richard Wolin. I teach history and political science at the Graduate Center in Midtown, and uh, I write on uh, European politics and uh, the history of European political thought, uh, especially the Frankfurt School. Uh, but if you woke me up at uh, two in the morning, which I hope hope it doesn't come to that, uh, I think of myself as a critic of various types of uh, far right uh, fascist ideology. So I've written some critical books on Martin Heidegger, who, despite all that has come out to compromise his le legacy still seems very popular in uh, the, the ever insular uh, academy. And, uh, you know, I, there, there was a time that I thought, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, that uh, some of these more rabid European far-right ideologies of the interwar period that were either fully fascist or pretty close to that, forms of integral nationalism and authoritarianism were more or less a historic phenomenon. After the collapse of communism, people were optimistically talking about transitions to democracy all over the world. And that, that has, of course, radically backfired. So I'm teaching a class on uh, the rise of authoritarian national populism uh, with a kind of a uh, modified global focus mainly on, on uh, America and uh, Europe. Um, and, you know, the, the bright spot and the reason we're all here today is that, lo and behold, uh, two years ago, uh, the Democratic Party came very close <laughs> for the first time in its history to uh, nominating uh, someone who identifies as a 
democratic socialist. So that is a, a glim suggests a glimmer of hope, and I'm looking forward to discussing um, the prospects of contemporary socialism with my fellow panelists um, and you. Wonderful. So I think, um, does everybody, do you guys have, you have some opening remarks to share with everyone? So maybe we can just go right down the Okay, row. would you go first? Sure. Um, it's about 10 minutes, is that all right? Yep, that's all okay. right. Okay, cool. Let's start my timer. Uh, so. <clears throat> I'll keep you guys on the clock, don't worry. Uh, in, instead of trying to, like, tease out some idiosyncratic definition of socialism, I decided to take the question to the masses. Um, so I have a few uh, definitions of socialism here from the site urbandictionary.com, uh, which is a site where you know, there's a, people post like their definition of something, and then there's like an upvote. So I'm going to post, um, I'm going to read like six interesting ones, I guess, and then I'll have some interpretations of it. So, hey, number one answer, um, general description of the left the belief that individuals should be judged on how they treat other people rather than on their job, race, sexuality, that people should have equality of opportunity, that in principle wealth should be distributed fairly to everyone who works rather than the minority who owns most of the economy and most of the wealth, that an economy owned by a few individuals without a strong public sector to balance uh, is undemocratic and unjust, posted by Scatali, 1,614 upvotes. Um, these are my remarks. The path to socialism, even some of its skyline, can be glimpsed only in the midst of collective struggle. These include riots, strikes, occupations, but also political campaigns, campaigns based on asserting marginalized identities, uh, deplatforming, voting based online forums. Only in political struggle, no matter how particular or misguided or mediated, is it measurable the vast distance between the world we want and what is achievable now? And yet electoralism, social justice, and anti-fascism are shibboleths for many revolutionary socialists who view the insufficiencies of the left as a moralistic fault instead of yet another barrier imposed by the ideology of our era. The so-called SJW recognizes an injustice, an indignity done to them uh, or to another and rallies in whatever form is closest at hand. Occupy, Black Lives Matter, the Women's March, etc., are all struggles that have manifested at a gathering point, a crossroads. One route, clearly marked but endless, is for politicians. Another is more of a wilderness path for the revolutionary. And the police do everything to keep this as a gathering of beliefs and principles, as Catali posted, with an emphasis on, quote, equality of opportunity and not, quote, the principles that wealth should be distributed fairly to everyone and that the economy owned by a few is undemocratic and unjust. Directing cynicism at those gathered at the fork is to assist the operation of closing the revolutionary path when our task should be to blaze it. This is the third answer. A lot of them are very similar, so I'll skip them. Uh, a socioeconomic system where every worker citizen is equal, a decent theory on paper, but difficult to implement in the real world posted by Deleted Scenes, 594 upvotes. The question of what is socialism comes off with a tone of cynicism in the panel description. Throughout the, throughout, the word is put in scare quotes, and at the end it states, as though it were a matter of fact, that the most important question of all is what did it mean in the past. I'm far more interested in this cynicism than in the question itself, for it communicates the untapped revolutionary political spirit of the day. There still hasn't been a mass political project that has mobilized the potency of American resentment and cynicism in a way that actually seeks to overthrow the social order. Such a project, of course, would need a positive vision to negate the negation of cynicism and actually build socialism. However, we ought to acknowledge our starting line has moved far back. Many people's idea of socialism is Venezuela, of revolution Syria. Are they fools for not wanting to be fooled again? for not wanting to wear the uniform of a century-defeated team? Would an appropriately defined vision of socialism, one where everyone in the room would agree on, everyone in this room, uh, would that be sufficient enough to inspire people to actually start fighting? When desire does assert itself in a measurable way on the scale of mass politics today, it is motivated largely by cynicism and resentment. 
The DSA success over the last two years, with its assertive meanness towards centrist Democrats, can be attributed far more to cynicism than any positive definition of socialism. Similarly, the right populist culture warriors use cynicism towards the neoliberal identity politics and uh, political correctness to red pill their audience on deeply unpopular social conservatism and the free market. And none can outdo Trump's cynical campaign that plainly shifts day to day with only a hatred of immigrants and the political class as is constant. While cynicism, resentment, and paranoia are universal, it is those who believe in anything that are the weird ones today. According to Pew Research, public trust in the U.S. government has been in the gutter for a decade. 22% of Republicans trust the government compared to 15% of Democrats. If not voting amongst eligible voters were a vote, no one would win the elections. Socialism polls massively popular, but very, very few go to the street to fight for it. The average Trump voter would probably be embarrassed to experience the fascistic catharsis of one of his rallies, let alone the right versus left street fights of 2017. Even right libertarianism is falling apart under the weight of its sincerity. In this cynicism, we are approaching an equal footing with the masses, not in goals, but in starting point. Uh, Answer seven. From deicide to genocide, socialism is an apocalyptic ideology responsible for more deaths to humanity than any other ideology in the history of mankind, posted by Socialism is Murder, 1,311 upvotes. Um, The greatest prognosticator of World War II was Leon Trotsky, who predicted that Stalin and Hitler would align and divide up Europe, killing the workers' movement and, in the process, uh, starting a catastrophic war against one another. Like World War I, it would weaken the imperialist states and the bureaucratic USSR to the point of collapse, allowing for an inter- international revolution that would follow, uh, that it would either lead to this international revolution or, as Trotsky puts it, a regime of decline that would lead to this low collapse of civilization. Um, his followers, hoping for the first, uh, believed that basically World War II hadn't ended. Um, there would be the ine- inevitable and imminent collapse of capitalism, and uh, so the policy of the Pabloite International, the dominant international after World War II, became to push and prepare for World War III. Such martial logic became the lifeblood of revolution in the 60s and 70s, with Maoist, Trotskyist, and other anti-imperialist sectors rejecting the Soviet policy of peaceful coexistence, calling for New York to be nuked, and criticizing Castro and Khrushchev for turning missile-laden ships away from Havana. Even in the era of desalinization, the communist world prepared for far worse Right, uh, a far worse righteous atrocity. Um, central to this line of inquiry is the worse the better, a lie that ignores Marx's inversion of millenarianism that tells us that history does nothing. The clearest example of this is in Syria, when a vacuum of leadership allowed the Stalinist PKK to seize northern Syria and implement bunker communism with an internationalist program. Whether a catastrophe is coming or not, our task is the same, to prepare for conditions for a world revolution, for, for a revolution preceding or during whatever crisis should occur. Answer 10. Uh, a word many would do well to look up in the actual fucking dictionary, not communism. Socialism can be seen in many Western European countries working very well. It involves being taxed proportionally to how you earn a free, a semi-subsidized health service, a minimum wage, decent social security, and many other benefits to society, posted by Mad Fucking Wooly, 1,651 upvotes. The pragmatist camp of all socialist movements, the one who turned the compromises of democratic socialism into a virtue, lived by a motto of nothing succeeds as success. We should acknowledge that such pragmatism is itself the mortal enemy of Marxist reasoning. It is our task to ruthlessly critique, to abolish the present state of things, and this includes, of course, our own movement, our crystallized politics, and ultimately our class. But how can we turn the cynicism into something useful? What is achieved by merely sniping at reformism, progressivism, and social justice? These ideas are far more vulnerable from what, uh, what, se- what it seeks to achieve and cannot, and that, and that vulnerability becomes all the more evident as they progress towards failure. The airport blockades, the ICE and DACA protests were all halted by a victory in some courts or uh, an NGO political group shaming adventurous activists and taking control. The handful of democratic socialist victories offer the same hope 
of centrists that a blue wave will crash the sinking American Titanic back to buoyancy. Instead of arguing with the ACLU, DSA, Democrats, or NGO humanitarians about the e efficacy of their work, it is much simpler to say, good luck, uh, but if you look to Europe, you must also admit your project is doomed. The progressive movement is like, an el is like the elderly man in Kafka's Before the Law. Trump, the gatekeeper who bends down to the dying man and says, since this door was meant only for you, now I'm going to close it. And I'm running out of time, so I'll just get to the last one. Um, answer 27, I live in a socialism country. If I am handicapped, it won't be a huge pain in the ass to acquire social security benefits. I have decent pension funds for my job and I will be able to retire at a reasonable age. My health care is paid for mostly by the government and my entire country excels in public education. I enjoy free public transportation and a nice house. The rich have no more political power than I do and they aren't able to monopolize all of the wealth and fuck up the economy for everyone else. Posted by eight, equal sign, equal sign, equal sign, uppercase D, dash, 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 uh, open parentheses, lowercase l, close parentheses, 106 upvotes. Um, here we arrive at the proper task of the cynical socialist, best represented by the orphaned anarchist, not to hinder the doomed democratic socialist resurgence, nor the vulgarity of activism, the class blindness of social justice, the hypocrisy of the resistance, etc., but to look at a uh, look at their full compromised vision, itself impossible without revolution, and to challenge them to want more. Since its fall from relevance uh, to the workers' fall from relevance to the workers' movement nearly a century ago, uh, the few anarchists left have become the torchbearers of anti-political cynicism. Their hatred of the state, big capitalists, police, and prisons becoming a ritualistic mantra that one must never interrupt with the questions of what anarchism is or how it could be plausibly achieved. Many consider this a weakness of anarchism, but it could easily be interpreted as somewhat accidental strength. Here's why. As social struggles emerge, there is a rhetoric of believing that they can win. In order to maintain that belief, the definition of winning has to be significantly downgraded from what the participants in the struggle actually want. Occupy was about radical wealth distribution. They instead got the start of a conversation. Black Lives Matter was about the dignity of black people and the end of police murders. Instead, they got community policing and body cameras. Those infuriated by the repression and co-optation of these movements carry a militant cynicism from the politicians of the party of order to the next struggle. As second international socialism reemerges as the lone hope of a vanished left, it is a shame that anarchism has not recognized themselves as to paraphrase Barack Obama's speech yesterday, an antibody in the revolutionary body politic against the pragmatist disease. In current conditions, anarchists ought, as Monsieur Dupont, Monsieur Dupont wrote, say only what they can, exploiting their long losing history as a testament not to, not to the efficacy of the worldview, but the impossibility of national liberation, state socialism, and the popular front. In our current catastrophe, as the global bourgeois dictatorship abandons its political pretenses in exchange for security regimes, anarchists represent the only form of revolutionary socialism untarnished by success. Its aesthetics and tactics may be awash, but its losing attitude is the hymn of uh, our, our culture's church of the negative spirit. Thank you. Andy, could you tell people who Monsieur Dupont is? Monsieur Dupont is a nihilist communist collective from England. Okay. What was the website that does it? Urbandictionary.com. <laughs> uh, is it, I go next, that's fine? Okay. And I will say, since I wrote the panel description, I'm sure we'll have a productive conversation, yeah. given your reaction mm -hmm. to it. So I have uh, a few topics that I hope to cover over the course of the afternoon. I don't know how many of them I'll get through in the first 10 minutes, and, but let me just say what they are. The first is to actually look at a recent article, or an op-ed rather, by Corey Robin, a professor at Brooklyn College, titled The New Socialist, as being somewhat illustrative of the kind of scene that you know, the description described and the, what, what I think is curious or interesting about his analysis. The second is to return for a moment to some very early daydreams of my own in the late 1960s and early 70s about what I thought socialism was at that moment in my life, along with a lot of others, I think. The third, then, is to kind of expand the range of possibilities that we might consider 
when we think about what socialism might be, and specifically to insist on the need to make it far more utopian than it has become accustomed. Uh, and, and part of that has to do, in turn, and perhaps echoing something that Richard will turn to, is that I really think that the only kind, the only uh, kind of, the only politics that's adequate to actually challenge the fascists and to kind of throw them back once and for all is a revolutionary socialist politics that actually represents a new world worth fighting for and living in and not simply a return to a somewhat marginally better world of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, then I'd also like to turn briefly to the question of um, I mean, how do we get from here to there, you know, from where we are to the possibility of a socialist transformation or emancipation, and finally to turn to the question of what does Marx have to do with it. So, uh, Corey Robin, okay, I, I, some others probably saw this, it was the Times, what date, uh, August 24th, it's mostly prompted by the victory of the woman in uh, Bushwick. Uh, one thing that's very curious, the very first paragraph, he starts out by being, dismissed, being very quite dismissive of a kind of a, a line that was written by Irving Howe and Louis Kozer, the editors of Dissent, a social democratic publication in 1954, where they wrote, socialism is the name of our desire. And he kind of points this as kind of like a hopeless sort of, or sort of like, what does that mean? Frankly, it's been a long time since I agree with Louis Koza or Irving Howe. I actually like it a lot. I think the, uh, socialism as the name of a, our desire is not so bad. It seems to me it hints at the vision of a new society, a society that could be described as a universal republic in the language of the commune, the beloved community of the civil rights movement in this country, or the free association that Marx imagined 100 plus years ago. The other thing that kind of Robin's essay, and, I, and, I, and there are things about it that are just hard to pin down. He talks at one point about socialism being about freedom, but then he doesn't really talk much about what the freedom is about, what freedom, for what purposes. And he also has, in spite of wanting to differentiate the new socialists from the liberals, he actually has a curious affection for the old liberals who fought the good fight alongside labor unions and so forth. He also has a very kind of, sort of uncritical assessment of Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, making no mention at all or assessment of the kind of the similarities of New Deal economic policies to those of the fascists in Europe, nor of the ways in which the entire New Deal edifice was constructed on a new arrangement between black and white, the exclusion of many black workers from Social Security benefits and other sort of welfare measures of the time, and also the construction of the whole system of, of housing policy that led to the segregation of cities and suburbs, okay, that was kind of part and parcel of the Roosevelt, you know, kind of model, which was crafted in direct cooperation with the segregation of Southerners in the, in the, in the Congress and Senate. So uh, I just would close one thing that Robin seems not to imagine that kind of what the boundaries of socialism might be, how they might be expanded, which I'll turn to later. So, for example, there's, there's socialism for me, at least, and I think for many others, is not a demand for a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Instead, it's the abolition of the wages system. Socialism is not state ownership and planning. There's no laying hold of the ready-made state machinery. Instead, it's the abolition of the state. And I think that that's, to, uh, to echo some of the things that Andy has said, I think one of the terrible kind of losses of the last 100 plus years has been the, the kind of the loss of the understanding that in many ways Marx, as Maximilian Rubel kind of described him, was a theoretician of anarchism, okay? He was not an advocate of the state. He was deeply committed to the abolition of state as an absolute essential precondition for the emergence of free humanity. Having said all that, let me go back to Many years ago, when I was young and not so foolish, 1968, 69, some people here actually know me, knew me then, at least one person does. Uh, I remember walking around what was then the heart of Manhattan, and I grew up here, I grew up in Brooklyn, and imagine how we would reuse all of the wasteful buildings for human purposes after the revolution. We would, I point to that building, we're going to turn that building into an X, and we're going to turn that building into a Y, uh, and that kind of... It's my best recollection is that my understanding of the revolution was somewhat magical. <laughs> this is going to happen. We were going to get to do this. 
but also that it kind of, it, it was profoundly redistributionist. It's basically what we were going to do is we're going to take all of the stuff of capital you know, society and we're going to sort of you know, move it around. We're going to take it away from those who have too much and use it for different purposes for those who have not enough. It was, in a sense, it was Occupy. It was 1% and 99% way before its time. And that was kind of fascinating how impoverished that was. On the other hand, okay, the, in, in light of what's happened to this city since 1970 in terms of the kind of, the sort of almost unimaginable expansion of real estate, of luxury, of waste, okay, I would give an awful lot for the Manhattan of 1970s, let alone the, the Manhattan of 1955 when I first had some idea of who I was in the world. That, and so one part of that is here in New York but elsewhere, I think one of the kind of first tasks of a socialist transformation is to actually take apart an awful lot of what we have and to reuse it for other things, okay? That it really, it's not a matter of taking it over and using it for our purposes or for the purposes of, of a free humanity, but rather to kind of actually not destroy it, but to take it apart piece by piece and to figure out how to use it differently to the extent possible. Uh, the... Um, Okay, so let me talk now about some expanded possibilities. One of the ways in which I think about socialism, is, and this is not certainly not original with me, is the epic of great healings, okay? The, the opportunity to address the long-standing and profound divides that characterize human society. At a very fundamental level, that's the divide between individuals and the community. It's the divide between males and females. It's the divide between the city and the country. The divide between agriculture and industry. The divide between craft and technical design. Design at large between praxis and technique. The knowledge grounded in human activity as opposed to the knowledge grounded in scientific investigation. The divide between humans and nature. The divide between humans and animals. The divide between pleasure and reality the divide between everyday life and beauty, the divide between mental labor and manual labor, the divide between work and free activity, the divide between production and consumption, the divide between imagination and reason, the divide between as much as we can get to what is good enough, and that, that, that's directly taken from the not long ago book by Kristen Ross on the Paris Commune, Communal Luxury, where she explores the notion of kind of what it might mean to kind of substitute communal luxury for private wealth of a certain kind of, kind of uninspired kind. Uh, and, and of course, the divide writ large across the globe between the misnamed developed world and the underdeveloped world. These are pressing matters but they also are incredible opportunities for us to expand the horizon of what we might spend our times on this earth doing. Uh, it, one kind of school of thought, perhaps some are familiar with, is the idea that socialism is kind of the, is the opportunity to kind of take great use of the possibilities of material wealth as opposed to the impoverished limits of value in Marx's terminology, okay? Value is not kind of the only form of wealth. It is a distorted, upside-down, topsy-turvy form of wealth that needs to be abolished. I do also want to say that there are some, it seems to me, starting points for socialism that we have to just take for granted. One is to kind of destroy and abolish the weapons of war, to close down the armed forces, to eliminate them, probably very quickly to eliminate the police. Certainly, in the case with the armed forces, to close all of the whatever number, six or 700 overseas bases that the United States uses, and hopefully we can do it in time before they set up their bases up in space. Uh, certainly to, to close down the prisons. Uh, one just last thought about one of the things that socialism will not be, and I won't bore you with this, but one of the currents that emerged in the catastrophe that became known as the October Revolution was the notion of transhumanism, that humans would become more like machines and there would be sort of a new synthesis of humanity and machines. You can read this in Trotsky's Literature and Revolution where he basically is imagining that one of the goals of a sort of a socialist communist society is the perfection of, of babies so that basically there are no longer any defects you know, you know, amongst the population. I think we have to kind of basically say we want nothing to do with that kind of, we are not, a, a socialist world is not a world where we get to fix human beings, okay? A socialist world is where human beings get to live their lives and freedom. How am I doing on time? One more minute. 
One more. All right. I'm going to jump to uh, what does Marx have to do with it. Uh, I kind of, uh, I, and this is an odd thing, because Platypus, you know, distinguishes itself by reading a lot of Marx, <laughs> uh, and that's really quite extraordinary. There are a few things I'd like to highlight about Marx, one of which is very early distinctions between political revolution and social revolution, and insisting that a political revolution was simply not enough, it was far too often an opportunity for a small group in society to seize hold of the state machinery and to use it for its own intentions, okay? Whereas a social revolution was intended to transform the nature of relationships among and between human beings. In the, on the German question, when he reviewed Bauer's book, he makes a distinction echoing that between political emancipation and human emancipation and insisting that human emancipation is the only goal worthy of human beings. The second I would cite is the work of C.L.R. James. Perhaps some of you can hear some of the echoes. In uh, the book published not too long ago, Marxism for Our Times, one of the things that James argues is that Marxism is the theoretical basis for a scientific humanism. When he says scientific humanism, I think we should read that as a universal humanism. Marx was the basis for imagining there, was no, there were no exceptions to the humanity of the species, okay? All people are part of it. There's no kind of sort of exclusion or kind of, kind of ranking of people according to various criteria. Uh, third, uh, I would... Uh, let me try to get this. Three, oh. I've already talked about Rubel, I'll skip that. There are two authors that I would recommend in terms of thinking about Marx and socialism. The first is Peres Chattopadhyay, a kind of an Indian Marxist who teaches in Quebec, who has a, a book not published not long ago on Marx's associated mode of production. He basically kind of has a way of reading Marx and better understanding the, uh, what Marx's periodization of what a revolutionary transformation might consist of. The first is the moment of the revolutionary transition, where if ever, Okay, the notion of a dictatorship of the proletariat as distinct from a dictatorship of a sect okay, on behalf of the proletariat might have some relevance, but where in fact the political battle can be fought through so that the previous rulers of society can no longer threaten the new order. And then it's followed by not socialism and then communism, but rather by a lower phase of socialism and then a higher phase of socialism. And I, I think he reads Marx better on those matters than anyone else that I know. And also, in a similar vein, Peter Yudis, who's a member of the International Marxist Humanist Organization, his new book on Marx's concept of the alternative to capital, okay, it's a very, very thoughtful and careful reading of Marx from his earliest days to the end of what Marx's real ideas were about the possible characteristics of a new society, and I think they're, they remain especially helpful. Thank you. Um, I guess my 10 minutes have started. Uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I appreciate your kind of ending with Marx since I mean, on the one hand, Marx certainly wasn't the only socialist in the 19th century. The term was coined before, uh, you know, he started writing. Uh, it reflected the, the new types of struggles that uh, emerged around, uh, well, often had to do with artisans, although we perceive it as um, <coughs> related to the uh, industrial uh, factory system, true in England, but not so much elsewhere in Europe at the time. Uh, and uh, I think it's important, uh, so gesture of solidarity with the platypus agenda in, in reading Marx and rereading Marx, and, but rereading Marx uh, critically as well, and uh, as we would, you know, any thinker. Uh, and I think a lot of mischief has been created, I won't mention any names, by, by treating Marx's works as... Uh, overly reverentially or as gospel uh, or, or dogma, etc. But uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, lately, uh, well, for several decades, there's been discussion of kind of a crisis of socialism, uh, you know, in, in North American context. We haven't even gotten to the point where we can have a crisis since, you know, there was this... Uh, insightful book written uh, 110 years ago by the German sociologist uh, uh, Werner Zombach, 
why there was no socialism in the United States. And this had to do with uh, certain uh, economic uh, advantages and privileges uh, in addition to the lack of an aristocracy, like a really counter-revolutionary uh, you know, class or caste uh, that, w- that had expanded the political spectrum in Europe to the right and in many ways uh, had a critique of, of democracy that foreshadowed what came into being somewhat later as fascism. Um, and here, of course, we, we, we have until about two years ago, <laughs> although it was percolating for a while, we've had a fairly uh, you know, moderate political continuum that can be the cause for own we, and we, we, I think we've all experienced, for those of us who are old enough to vote, I certainly am, uh, you know, the, the problem of going to the polls and, you know, looking at the candidates and wondering what the genuine difference um, would be. Um, but there are significant differences, too, and there were, uh, at least in the last election and primaries. Uh, the crisis of socialism in, in a European context, and I think this gets back to Marx, and, and maybe um, we have some uh, family disagreements here on how to read the history of Socialism, when I think of socialism, um, you know, I mean, I don't think we disagree about the definitions too much uh, or the history. Uh, I think of the tradition of European social democracy. And uh, I, 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 I will uh, express, um, you know, kind of arousing two cheers for the history of social democracy because I think if one um, looks uh, at the, uh, you know, the, the overall lie of, of recent history going back uh, a couple hundred years and, and 150 years and the most significant progressive developments in terms of counteracting uh, racism and, and elevating the condition of the working class and, and attempting to uh, unite in a sensible way uh, against the, the worst tendencies and, and uh, you know, potentials of uh, modern societies, I think the, the socialists have played uh, a very important role, and in fact, a heroic role. I mean, th- there were dark moments, too. 1914 was, happened to be one of them, um, but, but this is a story that's worth revisiting, and, um, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, I think, a, a real dilemma for contemporary politics um, across the board that the European socialist parties, um, for, for reasons that I think one can begin to account for, it doesn't really provide a solution, um, have fared so poorly um, you know, among their constituencies and, and you know, in electoral politics. The, the French Socialist Party was another, uh, her- along with the German Social Democrats, heroic party. This was the, the party of Jean Jaurès, who took this uh, important stand in uh, the course of the Dreyfus Affair in the 1890s and, and helped to fuse the ideals of socialism and republicanism, um, and uh, was unfortunately assassinated um, in 1914. Um, the, the went by the initials SFIO. Uh, but uh, you know, in, in the pres- presidential elections a year half ago, 2017, the socialist candidate. This is shocking and stunning, and I think cause for uh, mourning. Uh, received six percent of the vote. Benoit Hamon. Um, the, the lowest total in, in, in decades, certainly. And there's a reason for this, and it goes back to Marx and the framework of Marxism, I think. And, and the, the preliminary reason is fairly straightforward. Marx um, foresaw, and, and according to the, the situation or condition of, uh, you know, and major tendencies of European industrialism and accumulation of capital, as he tried to analyze it, um, viewed... Uh, contemporary society is predominantly a class society, as a society that was increasingly going to be divided by between two classes, a never growing class of, of you know, workers or, or proletarians on the one hand and a smaller number of capitalists. And if these tendencies uh, continued, um, the preconditions for socialism seemed somewhat self-evident, almost automatic. And you know, later at a later point after after the revolutions of 1848, Marx really didn't write so much. Eight, the Paris Commune was an exception, 1871. So much about politics because it seemed that you know politics was almost icing on the cake or window dressing, given the the economic developments, etc. But those those prognostications um, 
didn't come to pass. There are reasons for that. Part of it has to do with, um, you know, to kind of go back, uh, you know, to, to some of uh, Andy's observations. Uh, the success of the socialist movement, um, the, the partial successes ended up uh, uh, defusing the quote-unquote class contradictions and animosities. And, and uh, I, I think these achievements shouldn't be underestimated or downplayed uh, on the one hand. But I, we're in a much different situation today in terms of the composition of uh, labor. And, and um, you know, you all read the same papers that I do. And, and, you know, we don't have a working class constituency as we did even as late as, say, the 50s and 60s for socialist parties or parties that claim to represent uh, working class interests uh, to appeal to. Uh, the, the European socialist parties a long time ago or decades ago, the post-war period, began appealing as the, the working class base began to dwindle, began a, uh, appealing to white-collar workers as well, and government workers in the French case, and, and you know, almost uh, disenfranchising their, their former constituency. Now it's, it's fairly well known, and we have a big election, um, I say this almost tongue-in-cheek, but not, uh, coming up to, uh, tomorrow uh, in, in Sweden, um, insofar as it, it could be a real bellwether, and this is the nation that really invented social democracy in many ways. And, has had the most robust social democratic party in a in a European context at least, uh, at least. And, and what's what's at risk of happening tomorrow is is doubly shocking for that reason. Um, but so so one of the problems is excuse me you might want to be explicit about what that choice is for people who are not familiar with it. Well, you know, there's a party with neo-Nazi roots called the Sweden Democrats. Notice how all these European far right parties are misnamed. They're misnamed. You know the Austrian Freedom Party, uh, etc., um, and even the, the the National Front of France renamed itself six six months ago because they were they were afraid they they couldn't overcome uh, the stigma of their own uh, neo-fascist roots back in the 60s and 70s. So the Sweden Democrats that uh, didn't ex you know barely existed six or seven years ago uh, is uh, threatening to become the the leading vote getter in Sweden. Um, even if they, they don't succeed in that respect, uh, they are likely, okay, they're likely to be the, um, the second finisher, and hence it's going to be impossible to form a government without them. And this is the, the, the lot of the predicament of many uh, European polities at, at the moment. Um, they, they can't govern for ideological reasons and regions of principle and regions of, of you know, uh, you know, human rights, etc., um, they can't govern with these parties, um, but now they can't govern without them. So all, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, tantalizing compromises that are, are in the offing. But, but let me just kind of cut to the chase and, and get to where I, I want to end up um, to begin with. And, and you know, what, what we have in terms of the, the spectrum of presentations, there, there is a bit of a divide, as there is a, a bit of a divide uh, historically between... Um, revolutionary socialism, which wasn't really socialism. Socialism traditionally had been democratic, been democratic socialism. Social democracy and, and something like communism. And, and my concern about um, a turn toward uh, you know, uh, a revolutionary party is that historically speaking, and I'm painting in broad, broad strokes here, uh, when you have parties that are concerned with seizing power um, in, a, in a violent sense, in a military sense, uh, et cetera, and this is really the history of Leninism. It could even go back to, uh, well, we can debate this, but the, the Robespierre and the Jacobin dictatorship in the course of the French Revolution. Um, there is a, a serious divide, uh, you know, or separation between the, uh, uh, the elite, the party elite, and the base. And if the base disagrees, the base often has no public democratic recourse to correct the course of the uh, vanguard party. This is true from the very outset uh, of the Bolshevik Revolution, which is a very exceptional kind of situation, which didn't even have the pretense of having a working class base 
in a way to be consistent with Marxism. The, the leaders of that revolution, such as Lenin and others, recognized that. They were hoping the European revolution after World War I bailed them out. So I think, I think there's a real, a real, I think this is a quote-unquote lesson we've learned from the history of Marxism, the history of socialism, that a revolutionary party or a party or a group with revolutionary pretensions that's cut off from the public, from its constituency, and, and from uh, you know, uh, the, the larger uh, broad masses of working people, um, risks uh, a, a kind of uh, elite separation whereby in order to maintain itself in power, it's forced to commit uh, acts of, of violence and suspend the normal uh, civic freedoms that we need to, to, for course correction and, and to formulate protest and to allow the uh, you know, element of public opinion to well up um, to, to, to stay the hand uh, of the worst. This is, I think, a really important uh, conclusion to draw also from the failure of uh, you know, bureaucratic socialism, as it was sometimes called, or you know, uh, Eastern European communism, which collapsed in, in very quickly in 89, um, but in the Soviet Union then uh, uh, two year, uh, three years later. So um, I don't know. That's all. So thank you all very much for your very thoughtful uh, prepared remarks. I think we have a lot of material on the table um, in terms of different characterizations of socialism, but also of anarchism and Marxism. So I was actually hoping, I'll, I'd like to give each of the panelists um, a minute and a half each, and if you can indulge my special request, in that minute and a half, I think we'd all love to hear maybe one item of disagreement and one item of agreement that you might have with the, those characterizations of those three kind of distinct categories that your fellow panelists um, gave. So we can start with Andy. Ooh, uh, right. I, wasn't, I wasn't coming to be so combative. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, give me a thing well, to think about it. I'll, 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 I'll give it a crack. I mean, okay, the, go uh, ahead. On the one hand, I, mean, I have a great deal of sympathy for much that of Andy said, although actually, if I want to confess, I would really like to read what Andy read mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm not sure that I've quite got it all. Uh, it's not a criticism, it's just an acknowledgement. But that kind of... I'm, I, I, I do agree that there is some ways in which anarchism represents the kind of some, some fashion, the last great hope. But I, on the other hand, anarchism has its own kind of, it seems to me, uh, inadequate attention to the matter of becoming theoretically sound. Uh, I think that it kind of relies overly much on what might be described as political instinct, political rage. I have a lot of appreciation, both instinct and rage, but I think that Marx attempted, okay, whatever his shortcomings, to actually kind of interesting is, I think in the wake of the defeat of the 1848 revolutions, that's when Marx tried to make sense of what's really going on and how, what's necessary, so that with the advent of the kind of the opportunity for the first international, he was actually ready again to act politically, and actually I think for that period of time, for the next 10 years or so, was immersed in political work, uh, and then it, it, there's actually a really fascinating book we might to check out called Marx's Letters to Americans. Actually, they're from Marx and Engels. It's an old international publisher's book. It's not, a, it's not in print anymore. There's a copy available at the Midtown Manhattan Library. I Xerox the whole thing, so I have my own <laughs> private copy. But kind of he was actually arguably maybe too much involved in party politics for that period of time from the end of the international in the early 70s until the time of his death. But I think that anarchism deserves its own new theoreticization, if, and that's a bad word. I think on the one hand I want to say about Richard is that I agree completely with about the really this, this startling character uh, you know, in, in the European context, but not only there, of the emergence of these far-right groups across a different sort of variety of formats, all of which have their own entangled history with Nazi, you know, politics or fascist politics, and that it really is, Sweden is a good example, it is hard to believe. Although I would remind all of you that when uh, kind of uh, 
when Stieg Larsson wrote his girl trilogy, okay, Stieg had been for many years one of the most prominent anti-fascist activists inside Sweden, tracking down fascists, and that was 25, 30 years ago when Stieg was doing that work, and he drew on that to inform the political sensibility that was evident in those novels. Uh, so, but, but then I would also, I, I, I perhaps miss, not misspoke, but perhaps spoke carelessly about my own kind of orientation towards communism. I kind of insist on a small c. Uh, I kind of I renounced vanguardism in all its ways many, many years ago and have no interest in building a revolutionary party. I, I look back to the moment of the first international as being actually an exemplary way in which revolutionaries might be able to organize themselves. And I can, to give you an idea of how bad my politics are in some circles, okay, one of the things that I've been working on for the last six months or so is an inquiry into the investigation, an inquiry into the murders of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, and one of my key points of interest is whether Lenin, okay, and Radek share some direct complicity for having assist, organized and assisted in the murders. Now, if I can get Lenin, okay, to be guilty of the murder of Rosa Luxemburg, I think mm -hmm. that'll provide evidence, you know, you know kind of convincing that, in fact, I have no sympathy for Bolshevism in its ways. Okay, so John, your point of agreement and disagreement. I thought he did anarchism. both. <laughs> oh, well, I, well, I agreed on, I, I thought I got it. I have a lot of sympathy for anarchism as a kind of a refuge, but I think, my, it, it, I think it, it has its own <laughs> political <laughs> challenges, okay, as do we all. I mean, kind of it's, you know, I don't know, that passed wasn't clear enough. Yeah, uh, so I'm, you're sort of laying out a kind of like this minimal program what you see socialism as, which included, you know, the, the end of uh, the military, prisons, police, and this is um, especially relevant in our discourse today, where a lot of, even, even members of the DSA voted to abolish the police at their last conference, which is like, you know, really exciting. But I, I, don't, I don't understand how this platform works in a democratic socialist framework. Uh, and historically, I mean, you definitely see a lot of, uh, like uh, Richard, you, you mentioned like a lot of uh, like anti-racism coming from socialist parties. Uh, and that's certainly true. But at the same time, you see socialist parties becoming like the vector of the, of the hopes and dreams of socialists and of people who, who dream of a better life uh, on this planet. Um, without nations, without states, without prisons, without police. And then once in power, it just becomes increasingly conservative. And what happens to those hopes is that they get dispersed into these other dark areas. So you see, uh, like, the, you know, the, the more Bolshevik criticism of social democracy is it, it opens up or, like, hands power to fascism. And I think you can see examples of, like, the opposite of that. But certainly um, the way fascism came to power in the interwar period was through the counter-revolutionary instincts, the pragmatism of the, of the second international parties. Uh, so in terms of this current moment where people, like even, even democratic socialists, are arguing for these abolitionist uh, ideas, um, I, I think there needs to be a distinction of, well, how much are you going to achieve by electing uh, DSA candidates? Like, is Bernie Sanders going to abolish the police? Is, is Jeremy Corbyn going to abolish the police? No, they, they will strengthen the police by making it more um, rational and, like, uh, and reasonable within a, in a liberal democrat, democratic framework. And, and there's, there's progressive elements to that, but there's also counter-revolutionary elements to that, I think. Oh, uh, I was going to give... Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see where we stand here. Um, I, I ap appreciate uh, your uh, attempting to kind of bring the discussion to the, the current moment. I mean, I know our, our uh, commission here, our task, was to talk about the idea of socialism, what it means kind of conceptually and historically. Um, I, I also, you know, at, at a certain point, um, and it's not my, my co-panelists I'm directing this remark toward. I'm worried that, that if we ensconce ourselves too much in, in theories and history, um, we don't take into account what's going on now and, and you know, how to mediate it and what kind of role counts as constructive. Uh, I think that, that 
the the kind of a, a a purist longing for revolution, total transformation, uh, and the implementation of, of some kind of utopia. Um, I'm, I'm all in favor of utopian uh, energies and, and desires and, and enthusiasms, but I think that uh, once that the contours of utopianism are defined too specifically and concretely, uh, this can create problems. And I think that you know, fundamentally, I think if there's any lesson, one lesson that's been learned from the history of class struggle and social struggle and Marxism and, and communism's uh, inadequacies and failures is that, um, and this is going to sound really simplistic, but I can't do much better, uh, you know, if you have a good argument on your side, um, you should be able to convince other people and, and broad groups of people and, you know, ideally a majority of people that, um, you know, this is the way to go. And, you know, none of us would have... And I don't want to turn Bernie Sanders into some some saint. I mean, I did vote for him, but, you know, I mean, he is who he is. And, and you know, it's, it's you know, you're not going to get utopia thereby. You're, 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 you're right. But, uh, you know, you know it, it, it is, I think, really striking that, um, I mean, he's mild-mannered, he's, he's direct and straightforward, and he was able to, to reach a lot of people with some very basic and sensible arguments that um, shock, shockingly, quote unquote, aren't forthcoming from the majority of mainstream politicians. Um, well, we know partly why that's not the case, but, but hope, you know, ideally perhaps there is a sign of hope that, that um, the, the broadening of this perspective could, could catch on and, and um, I, I just don't want to get caught up in, in the risk of, of, you know, hoping for some um, totalizing, I don't mean that pejoratively, solution, you know, some, some secular resurrection um, that, that uh, leaves in the interim, which might be forever, leaves us holding the bag and, and uh, without a, uh, you know, uh, 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 practical course to pursue that can... can uh, correct things the way they are now, and th th you know there are a lot of people who I mean I don't I, I don't have to tell you I don't have to preach, um, you know li live in in utter and abject misery, um, not so far away from where we're sitting, and and anything that can be done uh, practically and concretely to to lift up their condition is is something I think that we're obligated to you know follow through on and pursue. Thank you guys very much for indulging that request. Sure. And now maybe we'll open it up um, for the audience. Richard? Yes, so... Could you stand up when you speak? Oh, so um, I'm just looking at the 1917 and the Flyers 1917. And the one point that you all seem to agree on is that the Bolshevik Revolution was basically a disaster. So you didn't seem to have any lessons or positive aspect to draw from that. But an obvious problem with that in terms of looking at the history. I mean, you, you mentioned, for example, is that when you contrast the experience of political traditions that draw from the Bolshevik Revolution, they had a degree of radically transformative effect on certain economies. You can argue whether that was good or bad. That no, quote, democratic socialist or social democratic party has ever had. So the, the question becomes, for example, you brought up the question of Rosa Luxemburg. I, well, I don't know about it. So the question but the Soviet Union collapsed. It was an economic shambles. Okay, there was no economic rationality at all. But, That's no, one of the primary reasons but, for its but, failure. But then, but, then the question, but then the question becomes, if that's the alternative, for example, the, the Luxemburg and Liebknecht, many people would argue, well, if Luxemburg and Liebknecht had taken power, they would have created the same mess in Germany that Lenin and Trotsky created in the Soviet Union, if that's your argument. In other words, what, when you speak about the utopian vision, it seems to me you either have a political vision that is social democratic, honestly social democratic, like Richard Boland, or you talk about expropriating the bourgeoisie and getting beyond capitalism. Because whatever socialism means, it has to mean something different from capitalism. So essentially, there are two visions of what socialism means. A Bernie Sanders-type democratic socialist or social democratic vision, which is essentially a modification of capitalism to make it less harsh, 
and more beneficial, or some vision which means ending capitalism, which means expropriating the bourgeoisie, basically abolishing market mechanism, and then you get back to the question of Leninism. So really my question is, is that the fundamental limit to which one can aspire to? <coughs> basically, that we have some utopian ideals on the one hand, but that in practice, what we are aspiring to is merely to modify the harshest aspects of capitalism. Or is there more? I mean, and that's well, why I, I, mean, I guess I would add, I mean, it seems to me that there is a third position, not to coin a phrase, <laughs> you know, in the last hundred odd years, okay, there was a kind of a tradition, albeit a small one, of anti-Bolshevik communism, okay, represented by people like Paul Maddock and by now continuing his son Paul Maddock Jr., by Karl Kors, by Anton Panikok, by, you know, kind of a number of really important revolutionary thinkers, okay, who, you know, kind of, I think, and, and, and of course, Rosa Luxemburg and Liebknecht themselves, and as I read Luxemburg's critiques of the kind of, at, you know, over a very, very short period of time, remember she was in prison until, no, until I think, September of 1918, okay, and she was dead in January of 1919. She already written several major critiques of what the Bolsheviks were doing, okay, in spite of efforts to suppress them and to kind of say she was moving closer to them, okay. They really, I think, is, that's a very hard sell to make. I think that she re embodied, okay, the kind of the best aspects of, to some extent, what Richard is talking about, okay, the kind of the, the powerful strength of late 19th century, early 20th century revolutionary socialism, okay? I think that kind of the ways in which that the revolutionary, you know, remember, Lenin was part of the Second International until, you know, kind of relatively late in the game. He too was part of that grouping. And I'm no fan of Lenin. I mean, I really, I kind of, and I think Lenin's, you know, kind of, Lenin's effective ignorance of and departure from Marxism, okay, has probably occurred as early as 1892, roughly two and a half years after he first Marx in the first place. So, I mean, kind of, that, the kind of I think that gets, the, the choice is not between kind of an honorable social democracy, as Richard describes it, and a sort of like being willing to stomach Bolshevik tyranny, all right, as a kind of, as a way to a new society. There are other options. There are other ways of thinking through politics and a whole range of really important issues around states and parties and, and democratic processes and a whole variety of things. And I just, I just want to reject the choice. There's another way. And I'm just going to, uh, do you guys have responses to Richard's question as well? Just really quickly, I think there's a dichotomy being set up between pragmatism and utopianism. Um, and I, I don't, whereas like pragmatism is social democracy and utopianism is Marxist-Leninism or something like that. But uh, the, the way out of both of these is, is through understanding the path to socialism through struggle by not trying to, you know, overdetermine it through like reading history in one way or saying, uh, you know, like teolo teleologically this is what will happen and like you know, this struggle doesn't matter because there's no party or something like that. But understanding how the idea of socialism, the idea of politics and the world that's being built will happen through these, you know, the, the struggles that are coming, the struggles that are happening now, and not trying to say anything short of, of X program doesn't matter, uh, but also rejecting the idea that only, uh, you know, a social de democracy in the northern European mode is possible. Yeah, I have two things. One, I, if I would close my eyes and accept Sweden and Sanders, I listened to this 20 years ago. Same argument, same concept. Uh, part of it is that uh, we miss that any system we have run by human. And the reason, like for example, Denmark and Norway or Sweden, I live there, I work there, is more advanced in socialism is because of their humanity advanced more than other countries. Uh, the, the issue with Sweden right now is nothing to do with labor. The issue is immigration. It's nothing to do with the class struggle. A Swedish girl goes to home and on the way to home 
get raped by, say, for example, Afghan refugees. At the same time... What, what happens if she's raped by, by an exactly. indigenous Swede? No, what I'm saying is, even by Sweden or by what I'm saying, right or wrong, the issue over there is not class struggle. Or Afghan girls go home and beat them by the Swedish far right. So the struggle sometimes shifts from class struggle. Right now we don't have class issue. What we have issues is humanitarian issues. There are a million El Salvadorian Guatemalan and coming here, they are stopped, they've been treated like animals, the blacks are dying like fleas, you know, because they are extra subsidies, they don't need their labor anymore. And the reason in in many ways we we gotta address is not just the effect of class struggle. It's also other dynamics that I think sometimes socialism got so stuck in their argument that they don't see that. Even Sanders, I work with Sanders' campaign. We never could go to like black or a Spanish or other uh, ethical communities because we don't have much of background or history to say that, to get in there. So, my hope today was how we are updated as an event. Everybody is accepting the you know, utopia of socialism. Everybody accepts Canada, Medicare is better. It does, we can't go on forever to say what the meaning of the socialism, but it has positive connotation right now. And that's what we are working. That's what we all hear is part of it is because Sanders. I wouldn't come here if it wasn't because of Sanders. I'm not agreeing with Sanders or everything, but he opened the gate. So what I was, I'm hoping to hear that is how dynamic we, uh, we address many issues and not 18th century Second Congress, Lenin or Tolstoy. So may I ask, could you uh, rephrase your, I guess, reaction and commentary into a question? Is the question that you want to pose to the panelists uh, whether or not they believe that the problems within Sweden today are actually class struggle, or perhaps more generally, is class, do you guys think that class is the kind of explanatory framework for a lot of the issues we face? Is that, is that your question, sir? Yes, for example, i give you an example. Right now, you, uh, New York State has a lot of unions, and most of these unions are, in a way, a tool to democratic government, to come. So we cannot you know, go and fight for union in New York State. They have all the perks they want. They, it, but what I'm saying is the issue right now, the brilliance of somebody in socialist side is how to address those issues. Okay. It's not just a struggle of you know, rich and poor have and have not. Well, I mean, I, I sympathize with your <laughs> feeling of being in a, a bit of a time warp. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, if you, you've lived in Sweden, and I hear a bit of an accent there, uh, it's convincing. You, you're aware that most of the, and uh, you know, again, this is just like an empirical observation, that most of the existing socialist parties have tried to incorporate these issues. They've been, you know, in, in, Fran in France, the Socialist Party has what they call parité. Okay, that means that uh, they want women to have an equal number of places, if not more, in their, uh, you know, uh, electoral sites. They've been very forthright. Again, just to take one example, uh, of course, in, in uh, you know, getting gay marriage <coughs> legislation passed in 2013, um, so and, and in trying to, to address ecological considerations and concerns. Um, so, you know, maybe we're on the same page here. The, the, the tricky part is that, of course, you know, what's socialist about these issues? And if we, we, we I mean, they're, they're important issues, but now you can see, now one begins to see the conundrum that I was trying to 
point to earlier on, not very effectively, I admit, is that we're, we're in very different territory from when the original ideas of Marxism and socialism you know, were, were formulated. And um, you know, my hat is off to these left-wing movements who have tried to, uh, you know, in a very sincere and broad-minded way, uh, you know, try to address these issues in, in uh, a sense that, that uh, many uh, center-right parties or right-wing parties haven't. Note just one, one qualification here quickly, that interesting switch on the part of these right-wing parties, far-right parties. At one time, they were sort of neoliberal in economics, free marketeers, as was the mainstream European right. Um, recently, they've, they've tried to pr portray themselves as, as uh, addressing the, the uh, demands of their uh, unemployed constituency, lesser employed, you know, tried try to become like, uh, this is national socialism. You know, with a small n and, and a small s, but but in any, in any way, just to come 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 finish quickly, uh, you know, answering the the problem you see, um, but but so now the the agenda for socialism has expanded, um, as it should, um, but but the definition has also become more flaccid, and and of course when we we look at what constitutes the left today. Um, you know, or, or historically in recent times, uh, the definition has expanded, but also there are the, the constituency of the left uh, has pluralized, and there are a number of concerns in having to do with gender and and race uh, and all kinds of and environmental concerns, etc. And it's it's really hard to focus on the same kind of messages in a unified way. This is it's a real challenge. Just constituencies in general have become. Pluralized and fragmented. This is this is a real challenge for for defining the meaning of socialism um, or even you know progressive politics uh, uh, in in this period. Um, it's it's a challenge that one one has to address and one has to Why meet. Why do you need to define it? Define what? Socialism. Why? Do you well, that that's what we're here for. I mean, it's a homework assignment. <laughs> <laughs> because I asked. <laughs> Uh, maybe I can follow up with. Oh, it's there. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm fascinated by this discussion, and I'm torn between going back and looking at what happened at Zimmerwald between <laughs> Rosa Luxemburg, <laughs> Lenin, and Trotsky, and also, which I think we need to mention that at least, that the formation of the Third International was a fundamentally anti imperialist movement at Zimmerwald rejecting the Second International's uh, support in each country for the war, for World War I. And so that you can't, you can't talk about all these other things that we're talking about at that time without talking about anti-imperialism, which is what the Second International always ignored, in my experience, and it's part of the new left coming in. But what I wanted to bring was something that Richard said. I, I mean, I really appreciate all the comments. It's, my mind is, <laughs> you know, to make sense of all this stuff. But Richard said something about a good argument should be able to convince people. Well, to make that good argument, you have to have means of communication. You, how do you, I can make an argument, I make it every day to my wall, you know, and for all the people that listen. So you have to be able to have the means of communication, you have to have all material resources to do that. Maybe we could do that through the internet to some degree, except that's all being messed around with. So doesn't that lead to a form of organization that is needed to make that good argument and make it effectively? And if so, the same old question, how do we get to that form of organization then? You can't ignore the question of organization. Then how do, how do movements emerge, is my question, how do movements emerge that would be built on these type of arguments, and how do victories emerge from them in, in, today's, in, in today? And one example is I've been involved in a fight against pesticides for a major way the past 15 years or so, 20 years. Never thought I would end up in that position given some of the history, but 
we need a national and international campaign around that. Okay, how does that campaign? It is emerging, but it would be great, I think, if there was an international organization that was articulating that type of demand and, and coordinating movements around that. So how does that happen? And you know, th can it happen anarchistically, or does it need some other form? Did you have a specific panelist you want to ask, or open to any of? Oh, it's an open question. I, I guess I would say, Mitchell, is that one, of, and none of the things that I described, okay? I mean, they were kind of they were mostly things, you know, kind of basically, kind of things that I would want to have conversations with with people over a really sustained period of time, and not kind of like instances of edicts of you know kind of proclamations and sort of uh, kind of henceforth everyone do likewise. So having said that, I don't, I don't think that much of it has to do with, with the kind of articulating the basis for the emergence of a movement. I actually think that the emergence of movements has its own separate kind of character. I mean, in 1952, arguably, okay, I don't know that anyone foresaw the emergence of the modern American civil rights movement, okay? Certainly in 1964, when SDS you know, split from the, the League for Industrial Democracy, okay, I don't think anyone imagined that some years later we was going to have a membership of hundreds of thousands of young people across the country. And I mean, and kind of in a very different vein, okay, for those of us who are of a certain age, okay, the notion that in a relatively short period of time it would become possible for people who in the 1960s who were considered, who were gay, who were homosexuals, they basically had to hide their very existence from just about every kind of aspect of society that in fact that kind of that could, could basically be, that world could be turned upside down, all right? All of those are things that, and I want to emphasize, no one saw coming, you know, and, and, I, and, that, and I, I know sometimes those of us who have some of the politics that I'm associated with have an almost kind of, you know, kind of dopey conviction that just don't worry, it's coming, don't worry, it's coming, okay, we just don't see it yet, okay. I, I don't believe that, but I do have some great confidence in, for, for example, if another example from American history is the kind of the transformation of the Civil War, okay, from a war in a sense to determine, you know, kind of what would be the limit points for slavery into a revolutionary war to abolish slavery, okay, was something that was kind of no one saw coming, no, even in 19, actually I think David Rodeck makes an argument that in 1860, I think it was 1860, that the, the Congress almost passed another 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which would have made slavery a permanent feature of American society. It would have been a positive affirmation of slavery, okay? Five years later, it was done. That I think we have to be attentive to, alert to the possibilities of things like that. They're, they're not over with. I don't, I don't want to predict it's coming, but, you know, I, on the other hand, would not, I would insist that we should not rule them out. I don't know if that's an answer to your question or not. Well, but I was I'll let Andy answer the question of whether it can be done anarchistically. <laughs> I was coming because without organization, then there's no accountability, and then we're stuck with people like, or relying on Bernie Sanders, for instance, to raise the issue, and then you say you don't want a vanguard, but he's acting as a vanguard. You know, I'm not saying but I guess, but I'm not sure that any of us if really address the question of organization. Democratic Mitch. socialism and vanguardism, then we're like in you know free fall. That there are di significant conceptual and historical differences between these no, movements. Then it's I just. Agree, but I'm saying how, to, but you're relying on a, a vanguard approach, but not calling it that. No, it's the approach of representative uh, democracy. It's not a vanguard. What so we? If I can, well, actually, it, I think we had a sort of unfinished thread from the question that this gentleman posed, um, which at the end I think you said, uh, you know, why do we need to define socialism? And I sort of flippantly said, you know, this homework assignment, we obviously invite, ask these panelists for their time. But maybe I can kind of repose that question to you guys. Uh, you know, do we, do we need to define socialism? Should we even be asking the question, what is socialism? You know, why or why, or why not? Ask them why, why they showed. Ask, ask the audience why it showed up. <laughs> I don't think it's particularly important, actually. I mean, uh, like I think the idea of having a, uh, you know, some basic principles, like you know, to distinguish it from national socialism, for instance, is important, um, and people should be we should be firm about that. But if 
if somebody, if like a Bernie Krat says, you know, I'm a socialist and everything they say is, you know, Bernie Sanders' platform, I'm not going to tell them, no, you're not a socialist. Oh. Actually, what happened at Zimmerwald was, and it, you know, that's, uh, I think it's more important to push these, these ideas and these struggles towards, if you're a revolutionary, towards the understanding that what, we, what you really might want isn't, isn't possible through the current system, and it's becoming less possible every day. I mean, uh, the fact that Kavanaugh is going to be confirmed in about a month, and we're going to have a court that's going to be viciously anti-socialist, uh, is uh, not to mention anti-women, anti-people of color, you know. Uh, it means, like, we're, we're going to have a court system that is going to shoot down anything a socialist majority representative government is going to prop up. So in the, in the near future, now, now we're having Democrats talking about packing the courts, right? Which is going to be like an incredible uh, spiral of, of madness that, in an already unstable system. So we, we might as well just start talking about how do we get rid of the courts? Um, because, because the possibility of, of counteracting the conservative court is uh, like this idea that we're going to get some justice through the system that we have now is just it's closing. It's becoming more narrow every day, and everybody knows that. What about all the, the Trump edicts that the courts have overturned or stayed? I mean, this is the only thing that's keeping us from the worst in many cases. Don't, don't be so cynical. But they, then they get to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rules 5-4 well, to in favor of Trump. Well, it does sometimes, and <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't always. When hasn't it? Actually, you know, Andy, I think that, uh, again, like 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education, okay, that was a conservative Supreme Court. There were kind of large geopolitical concerns, okay, that basically presented them with a kind of a basically, they had no alternative but to shift, okay, to basically signal the, the end of American segregation, of, of the end of Jim Crow. And I think that kind of nothing is, I don't think, preordained uh, that around those kinds of things. And I, I share some of Richard's favorable assessment of kind of the extent to which courts have, in fact, exercised significant autonomy, you know, in this way. And also keep in mind, okay, you, you may be willing to kind of, I'm, I'm not especially kind of concerned about what we eventually do with courts. On the other hand, juries are pretty important. <laughs> and I think the establishment of, of juries as a kind of mechanism, okay, a convening regular people, a group of your peers, to make a decision about, you know, kind of really important things is a remarkable advance. And similarly do I think kind of associated with that question, these it goes back to Rosa Luxemburg criticism of Lenin, freedom of the speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, those are absolutely kind of like essential preconditions for any kind of meaningful politics. I mean, politics now meaning politics at the level of actually a society discussing what needs to be done, how are we going to do it, and who's going to do it. Not, not politics in terms of what we're doing now and the desperate effort to get to the possibility of that kind of politics. Uh, that, you know. So I'm a bit of a softy on some of those <laughs> things. Well, so... I'm oh, sorry, I thought you raised your oh, hand. I, 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 oh, okay. Then Richard... Maybe I saw Richard's hand. Okay. So just... I, I guess I was curious to go back to the second international. It seems like uh, from different panelists, there's like a different uh, perspective on that. But I, so like on the one hand, there's like this sense that Luxembourg, as you just said was like for freedom of speech, but then of course that's true. The second international like socialists are for freedom of speech, but like it's also the case that the second international voted for war, and there was like a, this problem with imperialism, which was like raised in an earlier question. Is that still a question? Is does that history matter for socialism today, or is it kind of just totally settled? And is it the case like, and this is kind of brought up sort of again in this like latest sort of disagreement about the courts. It's like, what's the relationship of socialists today? What should be toward the state, right? Is it the case that, like, maybe, like, maybe you could say that, like, war is not really imminent today, and therefore we can, like, use the state? Although you said, I believe, that we can't, Marxists cannot just seize state power. Right. So we can't just, like, exercise state power. So, I, yeah, that's kind of like a, what's, 
should we aim to bring back the second international? Or is that, is that like, and, what, and what, what are the lessons to be drawn from the second international? Just quickly, I mean, I don't want to pretend to <clears throat> answer your question in its entirety, and, and I'm sure my fellow panelists have something to add, but also in terms of um, you know your question about um, whether it's important to define socialism, I think I think it is because the history of socialism matters a lot. The differences between the way it started out and where we are now, the complexities are, are important to take into consideration if we you know want to be more or less parallel in, in re re figuring out what it means to be. Um, you know, democratic and progressive and, and answer important social questions and questions of racism, et cetera, as they come up, how these um, matter uh, in the history of social. But I just want to give one example about the second internet, I don't know, second international, you know, I mean, I don't know how much we gain by going back that far to Zimmerwald, Zimmerwald and, you know, yeah, anti-imperialism, okay, great, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of Soviet imperialism after that, and also the European Social Democratic parties who, to their discredit, as people have been pointing out, voted for war credits above all the German Social Democrats. Um, they, they did try during the war to keep the Kaiserreich, the Second Empire, Kaiser Wilhelm, and the, this dictatorship under the general Ludendorff, they tried to keep them honest. And when they uh, you know, exceeded themselves, in, with war aims, especially in the East, in annexations that, that they said they would never, Social Democrats said they never sign off on, the workers rose up. And that's part of the, the story of Germany's losing the war. Of course, they were losing uh, already militarily, but that's the November Revolution that resulted in the Weimar Republic. So, you know, it's, there were, there were fault, errors were committed, but it's not just the, the night in which all cows are black. But real quickly, um, yeah, social democracy, uh, it was state heavy. It was statist. And this goes against the grain of many of our notions of, you know, direct democracy today. You know, uh, briefly, uh, Mitterrand's Socialist Party uh, from, you know, 81 to 95, uh, 95, 1981 to 1995, uh, you know, I don't know what was socialist about it at the end, but be that as it may, they, they, the party underwent an interesting process of self-criticism. We're in the 50th anniversary of a historic year, 1968, trying to respond to the grassroots uh, sense of autogestion or self-management, and they realized this isn't the way of the future for socialism. And, you know, they did have this autogestionist self-management current under Michel Rocard, who was prime minister in the late 80s. And so they, they emphasized at one point regionalism, okay? And they, they, they really tried to... to broaden and pluralize the historical meaning of social. So they weren't looking at the Second International or the historic French Socialist Party. They were innovating, trying to innovate along the lines of contemporary struggles and the way that history had changed. Okay. I have a follow-up question. So, oh, oh, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Oh, I want the other panelists to respond to that, too. Okay. Maybe. Uh, um, so the I, yeah, the uh, question was, do we should should we aspire to go back to the second international? What do we make of the legacy of the second international? I mean, it's like it's a defining thing for socialism. Obviously, we go, we're kind of going back to it. And we're trying, in some ways, to sort of skirt the problem of 1917, maybe by going back and like to these other voices in the second international who were critical of Lenin. Yeah. But then it's like, so what was Luxembourg trying to do? And could I yeah. could I ask a so just to kind of ask a follow up to that Gabe's question, right? It seems like if we look back across the history of socialism, right? You have the first international of Marxism and anarchism. You have the second international, which we're talking about now, of German social democracy, and that's where Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg come from. And then you have the third international, which, you know, obviously is characterized with Stalinism, and the fourth international, which is identified with, with Trotsky. And it seems like what's interesting is across all three panelists, what we're sent, we're, you know, the, I guess the picture that's starting to bring up is that, um, in some ways, you guys reject the Second International. In some ways, obviously, you guys re have mm -hmm. spoken against the Third International and spoken against Stalinism. And um, John, you made the comment that you disagree with Trotsky's you know, notion of socialism being a perfection of humanity. Um, and so I, I, I guess you know, if, if what we're doing is we're sort of rejecting the Second, Third, and Fourth International, you know, what is the 
purpose of, of even returning to the discourse of, of socialism. If not, I suppose, to go back to the, the first international. Maybe that's one way to ask Gabe's I question. A, I had a related question, which is specifically to so the question of the German Revolution of 1918 and Luxembourg and and the Weimar Republic. But clearly, Luxembourg and Liebknecht and the Spartacus uprising aimed at something quite different from the Weimar Republic, which eventually collapsed into Nazism. So the question is, like, how do you draw that distinction then between the Spartacus uprising and the Weimar Republic? Or is the Weimar Republic what one should sensibly aim for, and the Spartacus uprising part of a romantic legacy that one needs to reject, which seems to be... We might as well be studying the Talmud. I mean, I mean, why are we why are we talking about 19, 1917? Wait a second, you're opposed to studying the Talmud. <laughs> mm, interesting. Let it be recorded. I've seen, okay? a, I've seen, I've seen a lot of misfortune and misery. It's, so maybe, yeah. So I guess maybe to tie all that to get you know what I guess what are what is the point or what are the lessons of going back and revisiting this history, you know? Yeah, I think, I think one way that it is relevant, and I, I think I agree that, like, we, you know, let's not get too mired in, in dead weight stuff, uh, but um, the, the center of gravity in this emerging left in the United States today um, is, it, like, uh, especially around Jacobin and the DSA, um, people are starting to talk about, like, who was Kautsky? What was, her, what was his disagreements with Lenin? What did Luxembourg add? People are starting to talk about this stuff in the context of a socialist movement that's being talked about in mainstream media every day. I mean, Fox News loves to talk about, like, so they want to say socialism as much as possible because this is something they think, this is like the issue of this election in some ways. Um, and so what, what ha why the Second International and the Third International par parted ways is becoming something people want to understand and not just nerds and militants but uh, people who are involved in this movement. And I'm the... So it's not just Talmud study. <laughs> and, and may I ask, why do you think there's that, res that interest, resurgent interest in um, who was Kautsky? Well, part of the reason I'm interested in it, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, on, on the panel with, with two people who know way more than I do, so I'll acknowledge that. I have this understanding of the Second International and it, its social democracy. For a lot of the people in it, it was something of a cover that they were communists. They, they, they wanted communism, they wanted revolutionary communism, they wanted to get rid of the state, they wanted to get rid of the bourgeoisie, but to do it, they had to, uh, they had the strategy of creating the, the bourgeois revolution in Russia, for instance, and then from there, um, pushing for the proletarian revolution. Uh, and then 1917 sort of changed that, the Trotskyist idea of the permanent revolution becomes the platform of the Bolshevik party. Uh, so I think in the DSA today, uh, again, the largest thing, the, the center of gravity of the U.S. left, there's a lot of communists and anarchists and, and people who are basically saying the same thing, but they're doing so under the umbrella of people who are uh, Kowskyists, are partisans of the Second International. So that's why this debate is becoming relevant. But also we have to understand that these are people kind of replaying these historical debates in a situation that is radically different, in a situation where the, the, uh, the, this, um, this center of gravity on the left does not represent masses and masses of workers, but a, basically a, a social movement of activists. Um, so it's a very different story today, uh, and that, that has to be kept in mind when we're replaying these debates. But the intentions of people who are calling themselves democratic socialists is important because if, if they're pushing for something like police abolition or something like that, mm -hmm. or you know, if, if you have Democrats saying, let's abolish ICE, uh, this, this becomes a question of, well, what would you actually do if you took power and how is this going to play out? And the, the fact that like, we have um, uh, uh, Alcazio-Cortez saying abolish ICE, and then when it's clear that she's going to become a congresswoman, uh, she says, well, you know, abolish ICE, but then we can continue deportations under this, you know, previous, and then everyone's mad, but uh, that's how politics work, you know, so. Can I shift yeah. the kind of, the, the kind of the, the room bit? It, without putting anyone on the spot, is there anyone in the organization, in the room rather, who's a member of DSA, if you don't mind self-identifying? 
Okay. So again, if you don't mind, only one. How this? What What does this all sound like to you? I mean, what are your own perspectives on why, why? Why did you come today? Is this? Are these discussions relevant and meaningful to your day to day participation in that organization? Absolutely not. It reminds me of theological discussions of how many angels, angels can dance upon the, the top of the pin. Uh, no, I, I don't mean to disagree. I'm sorry. It's a little bit harsh. Uh, history is important. I mean, it's important, but uh, the world has changed a little bit, I think, since the first international, second, third international, fourth international. Uh, I think the nature of capitalism has changed dramatically. Um, whatever progress has been made or not been made among the socialist movement, whatever that is, there's been a great deal of progress among the capitalist cabal, I think, and we're not talking about that. Um, talking about um, Alexandria um, Ocasio-Cortez, um, the black socialists of America have confronted her on what does she mean that she's a democratic socialist, because she's a socialist. I mean, these, the black socialists of America, these people are on top of things. I think, um, I don't understand why we don't have a black person here. Um, I think that's a fundamental problem with DSA as well. If the racial division is absolute, almost. Um, that's a big problem. Um, so the group so you're talking about is a part of the DSA, right? Pardon me? The, the group you're talking about is a part of the DSA? The, the Black, black Socialist uh -huh. America? No. Oh, it's different than the Black it's different, Caucus. It's, different, it's okay. a different organization. Okay. Um, but I think they've been like schooled by Richard Wolff to some extent. Um, um, but I think they're very incisive. They're not talking about the former internationals. They're talking about issues of the day. Uh, their people are um, under fire, and they're not taking shit. I mean, they're not going to talk about theoretical uh, or historical events of 200 years ago. They're talking about today, tomorrow, and, and what do these DSA people propose if they are in, uh, in office? Uh, what will AOC do uh, once she is in office? She's she again repeated today that she's in favor of abolishing ICE. She didn't say, well, let's deport people under you know, the predecessor uh, Department of Treasury agency. Um, so I don't know. I, I, think, I think there are so think, many fertile issues of the day that we can think, talk about, and I think that question is very relevant. So I think you have one other. Did you raise your hand before? Yeah, uh, I'm not. I'm not exactly, maybe not as involved as you are, but... Um, Could you stand up so we see? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I guess my thought is that in defining socialism, or is that the question that we're still on, or are we like on a different path? Um, but I think, I think it is, I think it is, it is um, relevant to have something sort of um, fundamentally in common, uh, to just serve as a, like a motivational point for people to to motivate people to join and put effort into actually organizing. Um, something that I think really needs work on um, within ourselves on the left is that there are so much um, infighting amongst leftist groups. For instance, like yesterday, I saw a Facebook post that says. Well, if you call yourself a Marxian instead of a Marxist, like I'm really suspicious of you. Like, like okay, it's kind of funny, but like um, it's also just like you know things like that. I don't think is exactly uh, helpful to um, practical organization. Um, intellectually, like there is a difference. I think it's fascinating to talk about, but I think we just get so bogged down into it, and um, there aren't that much. I don't know, there aren't that much uh, I don't know, discussion about how to achieve this practically. It well, I just had a follow-up question on that, and it was kind of for the panelists. Is what do you make of sort of like the blogosphere and meme fighting, like which was kind of, yeah. and, and socialism today? It seems like, I mean, I guess I don't know about the DSA. It's kind of really, a, it's a shame that the DSA member couldn't come to speak. But to, it seems like from a lot of socialist parties today, it's like they mostly exist on social media and they mostly are meme fighting and blogosphere kind of commenting. And so like, which is like, you know, it's its own kind of thing. And so please, disagree with me. Like, I'm just talking about my own personal experience, but I mean, I, 
a very limited, limited experience. Um, but so, what do we make of that? And like, and and like, is that, yeah? What what is the prospect for socialism in this country or internationally today? That's the question, really. And like, that's like, what is socialism? It's like, does does the history matter or not? And like, what should be our orientation toward the state? Well, I, I'm, you know, kind of, so I've been, this is, so I've been politically active since 1965. I mean, it's a long time. And, you know, kind of, and most of the time in, in that period of a long time, when I was talking to what might be considered regular, ordinary people, cab drivers, I mean, at one point I was the elected shop steward of the largest taxi garage in the city, 2,000 cab drivers, something like that, back in 1973 or whatever it was, I don't remember exactly. I very seldom talked to them about the Fourth International. Uh, you know, I kind of, that was not really the starting point of my kind of political kind of work. Uh, although the group that I was part of, uh, and my wife Lorene was part of it as well, the, we talked, we didn't so much, I don't think we talked very often about the Fourth International, but we actually did talk about an array of serious theoretical topics, so we, perhaps not as well as we could have or should have, okay, that because we in fact thought that they would illuminate some of the kind of choices we might make back at a garage on a Tuesday afternoon, okay? I don't know the exact one-to-one -one correspondences. And, um, and I think that there's a great deal to be learned from, you know, from the study of history, from the study of various forms of theory. There's not terribly much uh, to be to be learned positively, other than negatively, about kind of almost the entire 20th century history of Bolshevik communism. Okay, I want to, and, I, and I wanna, let me make sure I understand it. It's not Stalinism. That's the dividing line. Okay, it's Bolshevik communism. It was the profound rupture. You know, remember because that Marx's you know, the 1844 manuscripts were not made available until the 1930s. Okay, people, the Grundrisse was not you know, it was not available in English until the early 1970s, I believe, and on and on and on. What people were made of Marx, okay, going back to Kautsky, okay, was a certain kind of Kautskyist, you know, kind of, you know, kind of, or, and, and to truth be known, Engels had a share of responsibilities for making it understandable, okay, and making it sort of, you know, kind of not, not as complicated as it was, especially in the beginning of volume one of Capital. Why did Marx write in such a way to give everyone a headache and stuff like that? They're kind of, but I think that kind of the wisdom, it seems to me, Richard, the answer to the question of whether it turns out to be Talmudic study, debating how many angels dance on the head of the pin, or something else, okay, is not something that's preordained, okay? That's something that's determined by what's studied, how it's studied, what people make of that study, and okay, and what they then do with what it is they found out through that study and debate, okay? So there are ways of doing it that are absolutely idiotic, and I have certainly been in rooms where there's been a lot of that going on, okay? And perhaps sometimes I've even contributed to it, I hope not very often, okay? But there are other ways of imagining, okay, the kind of, of doing that, living a political life. If, by way of example, read the accounts, okay, of what happened inside the Johnson Forest tendency, you know, clustered around C.L.R. James and Ryodunyevskaya in the 1940s and 1950s, okay? And it is not politics as we have come to dread it. It had its own problems, okay? It was not as idyllic, but it kind of was a very different kind of relationship between kind of people of, of education, people of theory, people of kind of, and, and they're the ways in which Johnson Forrest imagined their kind of the organization's relationship to ordinary regular people, whether they were coal miners in West Virginia or people working in auto plants in Detroit, was very, very different from a lot of the stuff we have gotten accustomed to. So I think that, you know, kind of it depends what we do with what we do. I mean, we, kind of, we can do it badly or we can do it well and make good use of it. Because I don't believe that the script is all done for what might or could happen. I think there's a woman in the back. Uh, Allison? Yeah, so I wanted to ask, um, you've alluded to this before, and you said again, John, primarily, but others can answer, uh, that there's not much to be learned from Bolshevism because we see Bolshevism as the point of failure, not the Fourth International, but Bolshevism. Um, and I think, you know, the reason that 1917 is hanging out behind you on the board, um, full disclosure, I'm a member of Platypus, is that, I mean, yeah, Bolshevism ultimately did fail. We're not living in socialism right now. But it also, to my mind, came about as close to success as anything has ever come. And that's why it's this critical moment. This is perhaps a failure that we can learn from. 
And I'm wondering if you have another moment, perhaps predating that or sometime after that, that would be that moment to say, this is when we can look at what went wrong. I, I've hinted at it already. I think the, the Paris Commune deserves a great deal of study and understanding and appreciation. I think that the period of reconstruction here in the United States is another period that deserves a great deal of attention. I think the moment of the Spanish Civil War, okay, the, 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 before the defeat of the, the Spanish Revolution, rather, okay, deserves study. I think the briefly kind of this Hungarian Revolution in 1956. Um, I think there are lots of moments, okay, that kind of are, are good starting points for us to think differently about these issues uh, of, of, of what politics is. Uh, but I, I don't think 1917 is one of them. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's the wrong place to start on just about every measure. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. And if kind of just, I mean, the more I read about, you know, kind of, one of the people who is kind of I urge people to read is Bertram Wolf. Okay, Bertram Wolf was kind of disparaged for years and years as a Jay Lovestoneite, okay, and a Bukharanist and stuff like that. He actually has written remarkable kind of analyses. He has this little Bantam paperbacks book from who knows when, the ten strangest communists I have ever known. Okay, uh, he, and he has a chapter on Angelica Balabanov. Okay, probably most people have never heard of. Okay, an extraordinary account. Okay, and one of the things you know, about the Second International is that Balabanov kind of more or less remains inside, you know, the, kind of the, at, least, at least within the social networks of the Second International. And one of the things she pointed out was how many of the national leaders of parties other than the German one, leaving aside Rosa and Karl, okay, did not in fact go along with the kind of the SPD policy, okay? There were heretics inside, not only those who split with the Bolsheviks, but others who were actually from the very beginning trying to pose an alternative route. So none of these things are quite as one-dimensional as perhaps we might think. India. Yeah, I'll try to answer that question. Uh, I've been researching uh, South American Trotskyism for the last year, and um, to, to research that, you have to understand South American anarchism, because in the, the, first, uh, the first decades of the 20th century, in, in some places, anarchism was the center of the workers' movement, especially in Argentina. Uh, and uh, it, was, it wasn't anarchism as we had it here with the IWW. It was anarchism that was a, uh, explicitly, um, it was a kind of anarcho-syndicalism that was explicitly anarchist-communist and explicitly anti-nationalist. And uh, there was a second international in Argentina. There was a socialist party in Argentina uh, that was the strongest in South America because uh, apparently the second international believed that in, in more colonial countries it was too backwards and colonialism was just a progressive force. Um, but in, in, in Argentina, there was a choice for workers between uh, the, the UGT of the socialist party and the, the fora of the anarchists. And fora was wildly more popular because they were more direct action oriented. Um, uh, they were winning all their strikes. And uh, there was also not a very strong national identity in Argentina at the time because almost half the population were immigrants, largely from Southern Europe. Um, and they, a lot of them came from uh, anarchist organizations as well. Uh, now, it, the anarchism in Argentina sort of disappeared for a number of reasons. One is uh, there was a kind of neutral syndicalist movement um, that looks more like the IWW um, that was trying to, to push it to the center. Uh, there was an incredible amount of state repression where hundreds of thousands of, or like tens of thousands of anarchists were killed or put into prison or, or exiled. Um, but, and, and also there was Bolshevism created like a whole generation of anarcho-Bolsheviks that kind of went to the Communist Party or went in some other direction. But also I'm interested in the idea of, of anarchism failing on its own volition in this regard. Uh, like, for instance, in, uh, in 1906, there was a massive rent strike in Buenos Aires where people were living in these horrible tenements uh, where people, uh, infant mortality was really high, everyone was getting sick, but rents kept going up and up and up. So the four was pushing for these huge rent strikes, just like anarchists now are pushing for rent strikes. Um, and nobody really responded to it until there was this huge spike in rent all of a sudden, of 47% in 1906. And then suddenly, uh, over 10% of the city was on, was on strike, and the, the police had to brutally suppress it using this residency law, which meant you could exile or, or, or send uh, leaders to a concentration camp in Patagonia. And so the anarchists responded to this, this, uh, this suppression of the strike 
by saying we need another general strike to get rid of this residency law. And that, that strike was a failure because people wanted the rents to go back down, but they didn't want to counteract this emerging nationalism. And the same thing happened in uh, 1910 with the centennial. And the same thing just continued progressing until there was this fully for formed Argentinian nationalism um, that was a very effective counter-revolution, and that, of course, led to Peronism. Um, so, yeah, 1917 is not the only instance we can see of a uh, vastly popular so revolutionary socialist movement failing. Could I ask a question of, of myself and Richard, but in response to Andy's point? Neither of us, Richard, has spoken to Andy's comment about kind of the, uh, kind of the centrality of struggle in constituting the, the, so the, the range of possibilities. That in other words, what, you know, kind of that it's going to be what comes out of the actual struggles, presumably Andy has in mind struggles that leap to kind of the sort of the earth and become somewhat massive and kind of powerful and, and, and shake the order, you know, kind of in some ways. What would you, I mean, I'll, I'll take a track at it. I don't think I've addressed it at all. Do you have any thoughts about that question, about how you see the connection between the one and the other, between the struggles that do emerge and how they might or might not be transformed into more powerful System shattering, system shaking kinds of you know possibilities. <clears throat> well, I think it's been implicit. I don't have that much to add. I think it's implicit in in many of our discussions of the the way historical and political change works. I mean, some of the uh, you know achievements of various progressive movements as they've uh, you know come down to us through the '60s. All kinds of these were struggles, these were social movements. Um, they're not utopian, but, but um, the pragmatic gains count. I think it's obvious that they didn't, they didn't come by virtue of waving a magic wand or studying the Zimmerwald Conference, pardon me. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, everything has its time and place, presumably. But, but, you know, they came through activism. It doesn't seem to be, you know, on the one hand, a mystery to me. On the other hand, you know, there's certainly no magic formula about the word struggle. In German, it's Kampf, so it's a little bit contaminated. So, yeah. And I think we have one, we have just time for maybe one, two quick, very quick questions, and then go ahead, why don't you go first? Mm -hmm. yeah, go um, I, I'd like to just um, ask, I hope you won't be too impatient with it, um, getting back to what is socialism, uh, the... Um, the, uh, the Nazis call themselves socialists, uh, national socialists. And Stalin said, said something to the effect that uh, he called his program socialism in one country. So what is, what is and now we live in a, in a world of nations. And so how dependent is socialism on, on being international? as opposed to national, and, you know, and maybe uh, something about the definition of socialism will come out from Great. that. And then why don't we take your question as well, and then you guys can address them together. Well, mine must be a question, it was just a kind of footnote to what Professor Wallman said, um, talking about activism, I think it also has to be placed in the context of what kind of a polity one lives in. And if we're talking about our polity, it is, as you said before, a representative democracy. And that activism cannot just be in the street, but also in order to make things happen at the voting booth, which is often uh, ignored in favor of mere demonstrative action. Okay. Do you want to respond to the international question? <laughs> I, well, look, I, I apologize. You're absolutely right. I think that a kind of socialism that's not international is no socialism at all. Uh, I mean, we kind of just, I mean, I hinted at it and kind of the notion of a kind of a scientific humanism, a humanism, a universal humanism, a planetary humanism. Three. I'll talk to you. Okay. Uh, the, uh, and I think that it kind of is one of the continuing failings of, and arguably one of the things that, uh, and I'm not especially almost entirely interested in kind of cataloging the shortcomings or failings of the Sanders campaign, 
you know, it's sort of like, see, it's not this, it's not that, so like that. I don't know that there's much to be gained by it. It was what it was, and, you know, kind of, and it had you know, certainly its own remarkable kind of characteristics bursting like it did on the scene. But kind of having said that, the kind of the, the lack of a significant, you know, kind of concern with the extent of American militarism, okay, and the devastation that the United States visits across the globe, okay, uh, was a startling kind of reality. And uh, so I think that's something that deserves its own attention. I mean, actually, and to go back, I don't, don't want to keep invo invoking Rosa Luxemburg and Liebknecht in t too much, but tr the tradition of anti-militarism in that second international social democracy for a period up till 1914, but continuing beyond, okay? It didn't, di didn't vanish, it didn't disappear, is something that really also needs, you know, not just opposition to some wars, but opposition to militarism as a kind of a, a mortal threat, okay, to the possibility of, of workers, you know, kind of republic emerging across the globe. Uh, and it just devastated Luxembourg. If you read Luxembourg's predictions about what was going to be the consequence of the war, I mean, it's just it's heartbreaking. She's you know, just basically said, kind of, you know, another year like this, and forget about it. You know, kind of, it's, it's kind of the possibilities are going to be gone forever. That's not, those are not her words. Those are my words. I mean, I mean yeah. we all, we have, we live in nations, and how, how do you break through that barrier of, of nationalism? Well, it, it's. And it's, why, why, why is socialism so dependent on being international? I have nothing on that too. Well, I mean, one kind of a, a footnote or aspect of your question that underlines its relevance is that one of the reasons that the uh, so many of these far right parties have been successful is that on the one hand, a sense of belonging, identity, cultural coherence has been eroded by globalization and neoliberalism. So they're playing the identity card, which entails appealing to nationalism, the, the same way uh, under different circumstances many of the uh, fascist or authoritarian uh, parties in the interwar period appeal to nationalism, leaving socialist internationalism in the dust. I mean, Mussolini here is a fascinating case, the, the kind of the, the wunderkind of, uh, to mix metaphors, of Italian socialism, the editor of those. Italian socialist daily Avanti, and then you know the, the shock of World War One. He saw that the way the way to get ahead was not internationalism. That was it was was nationalism. Uh, but but you're you're right. The, they but but he betrayed his socialist principles. Um, but but he tried to get them back in this rump republic of Salo in a way. Um, but but that's that's another story. But 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 the the. You know, far right parties at that time claimed to have answers to the crisis of capitalism that were different than the crisis, the, than the responses of the socialists and, and those on the left. So it's it's you know when identities are so much at risk, it's it, uh, internationalism and cosmopolitanism. These seem like very amorphous values. The same problem with the the European Union. I mean, to die for Brussels. I mean, who's going to do that? What does it stand for aside from a bunch of bureaucrats who are out of touch and uh, you know, all, ki all kinds of problems. This is another reason that um, these far-right parties ha have an appeal. I mean, one of the advantages of, or one of the, um, you know, accomplishments of uh, socialism historically in terms of the, the welfare state provisions that came into being after World War II was that, uh, you know, at least as a, as a nation state at that point, uh, you, you more or less controlled uh, as a political leader, head of state, uh, the budget, the national budget, and hence could you know rally your party um, for the sake of, of uh, welfare reforms and for the sake of uh, you know increasing graduated income taxes and uh, you know healthcare legislation, universal healthcare, etc. I mean, this this is uh, an important story after World War II. Of course, it wasn't through clairvoyance. It was clear that. Capitalism had had failed in 1929 and before, and led you know droves of people to to flee into the arms of dictatorships and militaristic dictatorships. So it was kind of a solution of, out of embarrassment, you know. But but um, now that's no longer the case. With the, you know, I mean, how much did Apple pay in tax last year? You know, 
I think zero. You know, how much did they make? More than almost any corporation's ever made before. Uh, you know, and it's, it's certainly not going to get better now. There are many such instances. So clearly, I mean, this is, by now it's an old story, old in the sense that it's been happening as a result of, uh, you know, outsourcing jobs to, you know, uh, developing countries, and but but also the, the ability of uh, international corporations to escape uh, tax responsibilities, and 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 the the politicians who are you know uh, in their pay uh, looking the other way while these uh, offenses take place. This I mean it's it's a it's a huge problem, and, and uh, it it also bespeaks the the question of. of Nationalism versus internationalism. And what 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 resources uh, uh, socialists no longer have at their disposal to correct the you know burgeoning uh, situation with income inequalities, etc. I mean the, the corrective mechanisms one has at one's disposal as, as uh, a, a nation state and, and in control of a budget become ever ever reduced. Um, so. And this is, I think, one. This is the last thing I'll say. One of the reasons that the, the traditional socialist parties or social democratic parties in Europe seem so feckless. No one's voting for them. Why, in a time of crisis, after the the you know collapse of 2008, why aren't people voting socialist parties back into government? Because um, you know they they realize the remedies they have are extremely limited. Um, it's also the bankruptcy of what those parties did when they were in power. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. They, they, they catered to a neoliberalist agenda. Right. They thought that was the way to go. So there's nothing socialist about them anymore. So what do they stand for? Why not vote for the real you know, neoliberal party rather than the, f the, the foe? Is that a function of being part of the nation, or is that a function of, of, of nations? That function of being uh, sure. of, of, um, of being nationalist, that, that you just can't achieve anything. I, I, in, in I think it. Terms. I mean, it may, but I think it actually has at least as much to do with kind of the the, the kind of events you know initiated by 1973, but already kind of in the mix before then of the kind of a, a new not epic, but a new dramatic phase in kind of world capitalist accumulation or the lack thereof. Uh, and that kind of the, the precondition amongst the kind of things that Richard alluded to, kind of the, the conditions that existed roughly from 1945 to 1973, okay, were no longer kind of, you know, sort of stable preconditions for the kind of maintenance of a welfare state. And so you had acting independently all across the globe nation after nation, state after state, adopting kind of comparable measures, okay, to restrict, to pull back on the kind of the elements of the welfare state. And then I kind of remember, interesting, kind of citing Zombots, okay, why there is no socialism in America, okay. I grew up in some ways on the kind of staple idea of how exceptional American was and that it didn't have all of the things that Europe had. Well, lo and behold, okay, <laughs> guess what, <laughs> okay, less and less, you know, it, can, it still makes a difference. You go to France, okay, there is relatively, there is national national health care, okay, you go to England, there is national health care. But, but nonetheless, okay, the kind of the sort of the, the stark contrast that once existed in the popular imagination between American retrograde, you know, everything and European enlightenment, that's not so kind of prevalent anymore. And I think this, we have to acknowledge, and we haven't paid much attention to this, the world shaping change of kind of, of the shift in capital in around 1973. Precipitated by the oil, you know, kind of boycott, but not that was just a kind of an accidental cause. Okay. I think, yep, maybe one last comment. Yeah, I wanted to mention that some of the institutions actually that did come out of social movements, that these institutions, that some of which exist today, which we haven't talked about at all, are seen as a mechanism for both repositories of historical memory, but also meeting immediate needs of people, so, such as the Parcel Food Co-op, which came out of people who were in the taxi rank and file that John was in the anti-war movement. People don't know that. And the origins of why that institution existed at the time to feed the movement originally. And other, there are a number of other institutions. And 
And so there is a, it is important to look back. The way we look back is important too. So when the person the Wobblies, when they set up all sorts of food, not quite co-ops, but giveaways of food and repositories, the first thing the U.S. government did in going after the Wobblies was they smashed all those food centers that the Wobblies had set up. And so it's important to, it's not an abstract question, it's a very real question to look at how we created institutions back then and throughout our movement and how they were protected and then defeated or could maintain themselves. And I think that's a really important question to look at it, how movements sustain themselves. And so I can't give too many more examples other than the one I gave. I mean, there are others, but people need to do that and we need to show how they can interlink and create new movement forward in sustaining or helping to be a launching pad for new movements and help sustain them. Well, I think on behalf of the whole room, I would like to extend a big round of applause for our panel. Um, and on behalf of Platypus, thank you to everybody in the audience for really showing up. I think uh, if I can make a quick comment, I think despite the gentleman in Green's comment earlier, uh, it would strike me as, as very important if you're in an organization that has socialist in the name or if you're considering joining one to ask the question, you know, what is socialism? So thank you all very much for your time, you know, this afternoon. Thank you. Um, and yes, thank you.